Hello, everyone, and welcome to Herbal Knowledge Keepers with Dakota Granny Woman and myself, Blue Star Dear Woman. And today, as we have been doing since the beginning of our episodes, we demonstrate the herbal database, which is a base culmination of hundreds of thousands of references on uh, botanicals, uh, herbal healing, you name it. Dakota has downloaded it. So, and the theme today is on Lyme disease. And as anyone knows in our local area, especially in Arkansas, uh, it's becoming quite prominent. And so it really has required our, our attention. So enjoy uh, this session. And remember, you can um, always send it to a friend. So thanks for being here with us. And hi, Dakota. Hello there. So, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of tick-borne illness here in Arkansas. Uh, it seems to be increasing and in other parts of the country, too. So it seems like this is the topic of the day, the month, the year, the decade, maybe, because it's being called Lyme is now the number one vector-borne epidemic globally. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to dig into it. It's going to take more than this session. So over the next several sessions, we'll be covering it as thoroughly as we can to help everybody get back on their feet and to help doctors and nurses because this is a toughie for them. You'll see why. Uh, so get your doctors into the database. Yeah, if you have a good nurse practitioner, get her in, and certainly anybody that may be suffering with this, they really can benefit from, from using the database as a key part of their recovery. So I'm going to do some screen sharing now, and we're just going to start with ticks. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, at some point, Dakota, uh, let's share with what the uh, research at the University of Arkansas is doing. I don't know if you have that. Okay, so let's begin with taking a look at ticks. To call that up, all you have to do is go into the search box and type in ticks, and it will come up. I'll show you how to do that, give you some examples of how to, to use the search box for the new folks. Ticks may not be the only way to contract Lyme, but they're the major vector. Here we have some different topics that ought to help everybody avoid getting this in the first place. So here we have a video on avoiding ticks. And show where you find, yeah, there you go. And then you go down below. Yeah, and I'm clicking that upward pointing arrow. So that's a good place to start, right? That's a good and, one. And then we also are very interested in tick repellents. Now, uh, powdered sulfur I haven't put in here yet, but that is another one, putting powdered sulfur on your legs and feet when you're going out in the woods. Yes, and let me offer a way that you can do that. Um, you can take an old sock pour the sulfur powder into it, not the sock, and then you just pound your boots and your ankles with it. Yeah. So ticks have been a real problem in this country for a long time. There's, in the database, you'll see a little blurb that was written in the 1600s by an explorer in northeastern United States. By the way, Lyme was really uncovered in uh, New York, Connecticut, that area first. Not that doesn't mean that it's only where it was, but that's what that's the beginning of our story. At any rate, in the 1600s, he was going on and on and on about how when you walked through the woods, your clothes would just be covered with ticks. Mm -hmm. And we know that they've been carrying it for at least 5,000 years because. Remember that Iceman mummy that they found a while back? Remember that guy? Yeah. 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 But, 
he he had Lyme disease. Really? Yeah. He, wow. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Oh, actually, and I just thought of something else, Dakota. Recently, I had a neighbor uh, bring me a, a sulfur block. You know, it's like about 16 inches high by about 10 inches wide. Uh-huh. And she said uh, she put it out in the woods near my home, and she said what will happen is the deer will lick on it, and then the ticks don't readily attach to the deer, and the deer, you know, when they travel through your area, they're not dropping as many ticks. Oh, that's wonderful. Right? And then yeah. also, also the sulfur in the climate, when it goes down to the soil, it enriches the minerals in the soil. Yeah, I can see that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So mm -hmm. here we have the tick repellent. And if we, again, open up the screen down here, you can see there are links to different recipes and ways of making these. Here's a simple way to make a blend. And as far as comparing them to each other, these are the, the, those that have been found to be most effective. And um, recently, one of the newer studies really emphasized the use of red thyme, which Folks don't usually talk about when they're making these tick repellents. Usually what you'll hear is use rose geranium, which is different from just a plain old geranium essential oil. And, um, and this one, not many people know about. The amaris is also very effective. So making up a tick repellent like this and using it frequently. That's one of the things. If you're going to use these essential oil types of tick repellents, you need to keep spraying because most of them will only be effective against insects for, I don't know, 15 minutes to half an hour. So it's pretty ongoing. You can't say it doesn't work if you only sprayed once and then we're out in the woods for an hour or two without spraying again, right? The bourbon geranium is a specific type of geranium essential oil also. So you can, if you're doing the geranium, go with rose geranium or find this bourbon geranium and you're going to have a better effect. So let's go back up to ticks and you'll see we've got, let's see, we did avoiding the tick kit. Now what this is, uh, dear woman, can you say something briefly for the folks here in Arkansas about university's program where they're sending yes. out a different kind of a ticket? With, I'm happy to do that. Uh, university of Arkansas, and um, I actually have it here with me. Uh, they basically send you vials and a card that what they're asking us to do is in an area as you find a tick, whether it's alive or dead, you put it in a vial and then you write down the basic location of where you found that tick. And then you send it back to the University of Arkansas, and this will assist them in doing research. I think they're just looking for if there's a way to identify if there's more prominent uh, disease. I believe they're checking for all the tick diseases that we know of. Okay. And here, here is the email, and we can put it in the uh, YouTube Dakota at the okay. bottom with you. Okay. Here is the email. You can send the email. It's a free kit and they'll uh, mail it to you. And you can just request your tick kit. Excellent. Thank you. So this, this tick kit is like a first aid kit. It's something that you make up. Here are directions if you click on this link. And uh, and of course, you can modify it according to what you are learning through the database about repelling them and dealing with it. Now, if you do, if you are bit, this is really important. Most of us were taught that you have to, uh, of course, remove it immediately. But if it's been on for, say, 24 hours, up to 24 hours, you're probably safe. It probably didn't transmit any disease. And uh, so, you know, it's been on a day, you remove it, you're probably okay. Now they're finding out 
that's not necessarily true because, well, first of all, there are some tick-borne diseases that are transmitted immediately. But in this show, we're really focusing on Lyme. With that one, they discovered that up to 10% of the tick had themselves an active infection. Now, normally, they're immune to Lyme themselves, but they can have an active infection. And if they do, that means that as pretty much as soon as they bite you, like within 15 minutes, they've transmitted it to you. So there is a chance that you could get it uh, very quickly from a tick bite. And I will add there are some other vectors that seem to pass Lyme along. One of them they're looking at now is the possibility that it can be passed along sexually. The organism, the Borrelia spirochete, is related to syphilis which is also a spirochete. They're finding some commonalities between them. And they have found the Borrelia agent, the spirochete, existing in people who have Lyme in the sperm and the vaginal secretion. So there have been some cases where one partner had it, was infected. The other partner did not. They had not been exposed to any ticks either, and yet later on developed themselves a case of Lyme. So there's a suspicion of that. It's just not guaranteed. So mm -hmm. now let's go to the tick-borne diseases. By clicking on that, it comes up depending on how fast your internet is. Now what an aborovirus is, is a, a, a type of a virus that can be transmitted by insects, particularly ticks. Here we have another link about how to correctly remove a tick. Check that out. This is just something, I haven't quite categorized this herb specifically yet to how it helps. So right now I'm just attaching it in general, Japanese barberry, uh, having maybe a broad action against all these tick-borne diseases. So you see down here, these. the green means that it is either a condition or a therapeutic uh, modality or treatment. And we've got quite a few different tick-borne diseases. So we know that Lyme borreliosis is a disease that has been with us for, they're estimating at least 5,000 years. It's been found, it was found in that Iceman mummy. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and we know that there have been other studies that have shown that it has been in humans for a very, very long time. Now, I'll say this right off the bat. If you were diagnosed with Lyme disease, consider yourself one of the fortunate ones. And the reason I say that is because, first of all, it is essentially a clinical diagnosis. That means that they, don't, they can't rely on lab tests to tell you if you have it or not because there aren't any really accurate lab tests. The Western blot is the one they usually use. It only picks up 50% of Lyme cases. And the reason for that is that they developed it using the Borrelia, two Borrelia species extracted directly from the tick. And so that's what they will test for is against those two species of Borrelia that came directly out of the tick. However, we're discovering that this bug is a chameleon. As soon as it enters the human body, it starts to change its antigens and it so that it can be it can evade the immune system, basically, and it changes into different variants. So initially it enters as one type of spirochete, basically, and then it changes into another kind and another kind and another kind, and it can keep changing. This is the largest bacteria that we know of. It contains 26 or 27 different chromosomes, and they're all designed to evade the immune system, partly by changing its expression, its gene expression, so that 
an immune system that learned to recognize it and kill it, all of a sudden when it changes, it appears like the, the old bug is gone and here's a new guy that the immune, has, the immune system has to start all over again figuring mm -hmm. out what it is. And they can do that over and over. So the problem with the Western blot and, and a number of other tests, the ELISA, it, by the way, is not as good as Western blot, uh, is that it can't detect all of these different forms of Borrelia. Just the two that came directly from the tick, which are just a shadow of that in the body once it enters the human and starts to change. So if you do get a diagnosis that you have Lyme, you're very lucky that you found out because Lyme is the great uh, imitator. It masquerades as other diseases. So people who are diagnosed with things like fibromyalgia, lupus, Lou Gehrig's disease, um, they have Bell's palsy, chronic fatigue, multiple sclerosis, those can all actually be Lyme disease. And it was not discovered because it, it's masquerading with the same kind of symptoms, creating the same kinds of effects in the body. Um, so, and also, uh, well, we won't get into that yet, but there are co-infections. So here, we have tons of good information that you can click on any of these links and learn about it. If you suspect you have it or you know you have it, it is well worth your time learning because chances are your doctor has not had really an adequate education in line. And in fact, there is a branch of study in medicine on, specifically on Lyme that doctors have to take in order to become recognized as what's called a Lyme literate doctor. And I'll show you in the database, you can locate Lyme literate doctors. If they're not Lyme literate, they're going to probably misdiagnose things. Again, this is a clinical diagnosis, meaning that the doctor has to know what to look for, and if he has a patient, for example, with fibromyalgia that isn't uh, going away, he has to know to look for Lyme. You know, he, that just might not occur to him. So in the database, we have a lot of information on diagnosis. Some of this is really oriented towards doctors so that if they're uh, subscribers to the database, they can come here and see what to look for, and it will help them with their patients.